LaTanya was an excellent student, good friend, and terrific basketball player. But even with all of her strengths, she grappled with some serious anxiety. She got so anxious around fellow students, family members, and teammates that she froze up. She feared how others might be judging her. And the more she thought about this, the more anxious she became as social situations neared. It got to the point that she avoided calling others and stayed clear of family events. She was particularly distraught because a family reunion was approaching and part of her really wanted to participate. She found herself in a terrible bind. She was afraid of disappointing family if she did not attend, but she was just as afraid of embarrassing herself and disappointing her family if she did attend. With each passing day, her anxiety built, but she realized that what she really needed to do was use the techniques that her therapist had showed her, starting with clearly bringing to mind exactly what she was feeling and thinking. From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about mindfulness. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of LaTanya. After going through the history of mindfulness, getting quizzed, and discussing the psychology of mindfulness, you'll hear the rest of LaTanya's story. How are you doing today? I am well. How are you, sir? Are you are you are you mindfully well? Oh, see now I ha, feel like now I feel like I'm on on stage. Ha, well, okay, <clears throat> it's about nine fourteen a.m. as we're recording this. Mm-hmm. How many minutes of your waking day so far have you been mindful? So I'm going to be totally honest that I would say when I got here, I intentionally got myself into that space. But leading up to it, I would say I was pretty mindless. Not I was so much. doing the like mommy running around school routine this morning. I think I've been mindful, but we're going to have to define some things first. Cheers. To, to make sure that I'm on track there. So let, let's, okay, so what's a good definition of mindfulness? So if you Google the definition of mindfulness, it's almost like a computer page long. So I'm going to give you what I call a working definition of mindfulness good. that I give to all my clients. So we say mindfulness is paying attention on purpose so notice that part of it, paying attention on purpose to what you are thinking and how you are feeling without judgment, another big piece of it, so that I can then choose how I want to react, respond, behave. So paying attention on purpose to how you're thinking and how you're feeling without judgment so you can then choose how you want to react, respond, behave. So what what about sensation or sensory input in, in your environment, how does, how does that play into mindfulness in your definition? So the idea of, of I'm going to pay attention to what's coming in and how I'm reacting and responding to it, right? So if somebody is talking to me, if there's an experience happening, if there's, you know, if it's like I'm driving, so I'm paying attention to what I'm thinking about what's happening and how I'm emotionally and physically responding to what's going on. Right. So I'm paying attention. I'm putting all of that together. So we call it noticing and observing. So I notice what's happening. And then I do a little personal observation because I want to be able to take that break before I react and respond. So it goes into that idea. So so basic CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is rooted in this idea that thoughts drive feelings and feelings drive behavior. So a lot of times people think that it's your thoughts that drive your behavior. Like, oh, I think about something and I do it. It's like Burr. our thought creates how we feel. And then our feelings are what determine how we react and respond. Mm -hmm. But there is that ability to take a break before I respond. It doesn't have to be instantaneous. I can be mindful. I can do a quick check-in and then react and respond. But that's something that you have to get good at. Oh, right. which is why we say we practice, in my opinion, unless you get to be one of those awesome people that sit on a mountain for like every day of your life for thousands of years, then maybe you attain mindfulness. But most of us practice mindfulness our whole lives. Now, practice as in try to get that. I have to do it. I have to be intentional. I have to try to keep using it. I have to be mindful to be mindful. Now, is there a distinction between mindful and mindfulness? So you and I talked about this earlier. So yes, I think that sometimes our minds are very full 
but of mindless kind of stuff. Like this, like what I was talking about this morning, like I got to get the humans out the door and am I packing lunches and what do I have on my schedule and my agenda, right? So it's full, but of what we would say sort of mindless stuff that's that we're not really being intentional in how we pay attention to it. We, um, we don't notice whether it's good and or bad. It's just stuff. It's like white noise, would that make sense? Right. So that to me is when our minds are very full. Then sometimes... Full, full F-U-L-L. There we go. Okay, full so as in a... like my glass is full, but then not um, not intentional, not purposeful, not mindful, F-U-L. Right. Okay. Then what I think is painful and I think what a lot of our clients experience and a lot of where mindfulness, F-U-L, comes in to being so critical is that Sometimes we're very in the moment, but it's extremely painful. Like we're very aware of failures or negative emotions or behaviors that we just engaged in that feel bad, right? So we can be very in the moment, but it's harsh and it's critical. I can't believe I just did that. I'm so stupid. I feel so awful. I mean, you know, we're very aware of what's happening in the moment, but it's extremely harsh and critical. So mindful in 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 the way that's healthy and is present and is useful in the way that we want to teach it for people is mindful F-U-L. But it's that, it's the two pieces that I highlighted when I was giving that definition. It's I'm doing it on purpose and it's without judgment. Because all of these emotions that people so quickly name as negative, so sadness, anger, anxiety, fear, they're only negative because we've put a, a, put a judgment on them, right? Anxiety is not my problem. I say to my clients all the time, anxiety is the only mental health diagnosis I need you to have a little bit of in order to be a healthy, functioning human being, right? Okay. So anxiety is not your problem. It's what you do with it or how you let it impair your functionality or your relationships that makes it a problem. So if I'm just noticing, wow, I'm anxious. Okay. How come? So there's the observation part. What's, what's happening around me that's making me anxious? Okay. I'm just going to notice. And now I'm going to give a beat before I act. Okay. What do I want to do? So that's what mindful in a healthy kind of way looks like. All right. So let me share something from my day, my morning. Already? And you tell me whether or not I was being mindful. All right? I really, I like to run. Mm. And this is going to sound crazy, but I, I prefer running on a treadmill to road running. Th- I, there's that, no judgment in it's this not that I It's not that I dislike running on the road, but I prefer on a treadmill because I have total control over the pace and everything, and I can just zone out. I don't have to think about like the curb or cars or anything. I can just do my thing. And I, I, I think a lot about my breathing as I'm running. And okay, I'm, I'm, just, I'm totally geek out here. Geek out running I think this stuff. is great. Okay? The, so, you, you are I, a runner. Like, yeah. like you're like when they talk about yeah. like runners that are like, yeah, so, you are a so runner. So in addition to adjusting like the pace what, and how the distance, I set cadences for my breathing. And so I'll go like a minute where I'm breathing every stride. And then I'll go for a couple of minutes where I'm breathing like every other stride. And then I'll try to really slow it down and see how long I can go, you know, every third or fourth stride. Wow. Mindfulness or not? What am I, what am I doing there? How would you define that? Are you judging whether or not you're, you're sticking with your little standard? Like, do you become critical if you can't make it three to four strides? No. Are you staying just really present in the moment and just counting breaths and noticing what's happening in your body as you're running and how you're responding to your cadence and different things like that? That's the second thing you said. It, I'm really – I'm thinking of almost nothing else except my breathing. Oh, yeah. Then you're being 100% mindful. And, and one reason I do this is it it gets my mind off the pain, <laughs> which I don't mind. I mean, right. I, don't, I don't – No, that is a great example of mindfulness. And and I think where people get stuck sometimes is that they do envision this very laborious process that has to be a certain length of time or, or, you know, very involved, sort of that like Zen like, and and I think you just gave a great example of everyday implementation of mindfulness. Because don't forget, one of the key pieces of mindfulness is it's like lifting weights for the front part of your brain, like your frontal lobe right behind your forehead, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that that takes practice to get 
from the side part of our brain, the feeling part of our brain. So sort of like how you said, like, I'm, I'm trying to not pay attention to the pain. So like your amygdala and all those, your limbic system, all that stuff firing in the side part of your brain. We want to get the front part of our brain engaged, which has to be purposeful and intentional. So what you do, if you do this every morning, is great exercise for that front part of your brain, which then makes it easier when, for example, you're mad at your kid and and you want to like fly off the handle and that those emotions that you're experiencing have you wanting to like react and respond to that in an angry, frustrated kind of way. You go, wait a second, I know how to engage this part of my brain because I do it every morning. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to pay attention, right? That's what the purpose of this you is. Can, so yeah. You can generalize. Then. Oh, yeah. Once you get then, one context. Yep. It's like practice for a game. All right. So uh, later, I think uh, in our third segment, you're going to take me through a mindfulness exercise yes, here, I which would be pretty cool. I'm looking Doo-doo-doo. forward to this. Yay. All right. So as usual, we want to go through a timeline on, on our topic. And uh, Brandon, our producer, did some research. And a lot of the, the information we're going to share here comes from the Positive Psychology Program. And we'll include a link to their uh, website on our website. Right really on. good stuff. So. Yep. Yep. Uh, So the origins of mindfulness. Hinduism is considered to be the oldest religion in the world, and its history reads in part like a history of mindfulness with ancient discussions of yoga and meditation. And those are two things, yoga and meditation, that a lot of lay people associate with mindfulness now. Correct. There are two that involve that. So Buddhism's history is much more well-defined than that of Hinduism. Buddhism was founded around 400 to 500 BC by Siddhartha Gautama, who came to be referred to as the Buddha. By the way, did you see? I think it's called the movie is called Little Buddha, with where Keanu Reeves plays plays him. Did you see that? <sighs> no, but you just blew my mind. Against, <laughs> casting against type. Um, it's not the movie isn't all about him, but he's played he plays the the original Buddha in flashbacks. It's actually a really good movie. So, I, being I'm, a mindfulness I'm, I'm, person, you I should was going to say I'm out. having a hard time putting those two things together. I also think it's very interesting that I do not believe somebody can fact check me here that Siddhartha looks like what most of us think of when we think of Buddha as this like little happy, fat bellied human. He was like the exact opposite of that. He was like tall and thin. Well, that, that's there. You got Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm, re- I'm retaining all of the things that I want to say. Mindfulness plays a significant role in Buddhism as it is the first step towards enlightenment. You can still see those Buddhism roots today. Most Western mindfulness is largely indebted to Buddhism. Now, let's jump, gosh, a few thousand years now. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. All right, 1979, John Kabat Zinn founded the Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Program. If you're scoring at home, that's the MBSR. At the University of Massachusetts, UMass, this program sparked the application of mindfulness ideas and practices in medicine and is one of the biggest factors in bringing mindfulness to the Western world. According to Kabat-Zinn, the practice of mindfulness may benefit people in Western society who might be unwilling to adopt Buddhist traditions or vocabulary. Contemporary mental health professionals who have introduced mindfulness practice into clinical programs usually teach these skills independently of the religious and cultural traditions of their origins. So what we've got here, we're talking about a practice that it was rooted in religion, but it's become mm-hmm. secular, largely. It was a, yeah, I would say I'd describe it as, as it was a step of the religion, like it was a, right. a, a worked component of yes. like, this is right. right. Yeah. So yeah, we, you know, secularly we teach it. Separately. Right. So mindfulness is growing in popularity as as a practice in daily life, apart from meditation. To the layperson, mindfulness is moment by moment awareness of thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and the surrounding environment. So so compare that lay definition to what you gave me earlier. What's missing from that definition in your mind? I think the purposeful component of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, moment by moment is good, but I really think it's important to recognize that there's that intentionality behind it and the lack of judgment. That's right. That's which is right. The big piece. So mindfulness is characterized by acceptance, which can be defined as focusing on your thoughts and feelings with non-judgment. There we go. And an open mind. We got to it. Okay. Looking around modern society, we see mindfulness attached to all sorts of activities, such as drawing, painting, cooking, eating, and of course. Yoga. And as we learned earlier, 
running on a treadmill. <laughs> well, I, I think, I mean, I would add to this or my little caveat would be you can do anything mindfully. You can work mindfully. You can, you know, I can eat. I can brush my teeth. I can bathe my kids. I can parent. I can discipline mindfully. It doesn't have to be like it can be a fully incorporated piece of your everyday life. All right, this is a really cool topic. More to come on the other side. Our quiz master extraordinaire, Mara Teal, could not join us this episode, so we're bringing somebody off the bench. Elise Howell is here. Elise is a writer and therapist who utilizes mindfulness in her clinical work. Welcome. Hey, guys. That's true. I do use mindfulness. <laughs> now, you've, you've been on our podcast before, um, but this is the first time running the quiz. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're... Just a little bit competitive. I have heard. I've heard I'm walking into a rivalry. <laughs> well, you are walking into what was somewhat of an unfair experience the last time around. You're just saying that because you're a woman. I am not saying that because I'm a woman. I'm saying it because it was the most biased thing I perhaps have ever had to be competitively involved in. I'm getting. Look, I have to you practice can, mindfulness right now because I'm getting the feelings all over again that I had. Good. I'm glad you're able to practice what quiz. you preach. <sighs> Deep you can press. cut the tension with a knife in here, guys. <laughs> all right. So. The funny thing is, we're we are actually we well, like each other. You just can't tell. Yes. I have high expectations because you study the mind, and I know that you teach our mindfulness <laughs> in our DBT classes here. So today, <gasps> no we'll pressure. Your challenge today, um, you will be presented with three different mindfulness scenarios. So we're putting your knowledge to the test this morning. um, And I want unique answers from both of you. So no copying, Craig. And (laughs) Notice who she said couldn't copy. Yes. And (laughs) unique answers from both of you showing, demonstrating your knowledge of mindfulness and appropriate application in how your mindfulness skills could help you finesse the situation at hand effectively. So... Oh, like, are you I ready? Did you really just have under, Did you just have feelings about this? Like I'm all not, of a sudden, I'm like, oh damn! I'm not certain what we're doing, but I guess it'll become clear as we start, right? Yes, you're going to be presented with a scenario where mindfulness skills would help you. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, well, and right. I want you to tell me how you would respond. Okay. You will be judged and awarded points based on you both can earn points for each. Okay, but wait, I have a question. Yes. Am I responding as if somebody, like, this scenario is in my office and I am the clinician or as if it's me? Yes. Oh, snap. You. Do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how you're the test of how you'd apply it in these scenarios. Most of them will be relatable. You might have to put yourself in a hypothetical situation, though. Okay. All right, bring it on. Are we good? Yes. Okay. A friend calls you in the middle of a hectic work day, and you are feeling pressure to meet an end-of-the-day deadline. She's received some tough news at the doctor's office and wants to talk. You start to run through worst-case scenarios in your head. How can mindfulness skills help you get present for your conversation with her? Whoever wants to jump in. All right, I'm going to go first. Okay. Um, Okay, I, I would list, I would think about the things that I'm worried are going to happen if I take on this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would, you know, am I, am I gonna miss the deadline? If I miss the deadline, what's going to happen? But I would, I would be non-judgmental in, in coming up with this sort of drop-down list in my mind. And at the same time, I, I, I might, um, I might focus on something in my workspace, maybe, maybe a, a shaft of light or something, and just kind of bring some awareness to that to keep my affect calm. And this human is on the phone? This human is on the phone. Okay. So I think probably what I would do is in that moment do a quick values check for myself, like the idea of all the things that I have to get done less important to me than friend on the phone because I'm assuming friend on the phone if they're calling me. Pretty important. Pretty important friend. Um, And then I probably would try to, and I hate to say similarly, To Craig, I would try to probably pick something to focus my attention to, like on my desk. But then I would really try to 
stay in a space of paying very much attention to what she is saying. So really focusing in on what she is saying and being thoughtful and in my listening so that I don't get distracted by all the other things that that may like be firing in my brain. So really trying to draw attention to what she's saying and what I'm thinking in response. And I, you know, I would probably say dual tracking at the same time that trying to regulate my breathing so that any anxiety that I may have be experiencing about what she may be saying, because I'm guessing I'm also going to be a little anxious about what she's saying, doesn't get in the way of my ability to respond. Those are both really solid answers, hearing some non-judgment, some grounding, some one mindfully. All right. I think for this one, Craig, a thousand points. I got fights. Three thousand. <laughs> like I'm happy just to be on the board. Okay. I mean, this is your thing, <laughs> fights. All this right. is your thing. All right. All I know, right. but see, like, I'm waiting for like the brain question. I'm gonna be like, oh, <laughs> there's three parts to the brain. You might, okay. you might get lucky today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Monday morning, and you're trying to get out the door for work. Mm. You are looking for a tumbler or to go mug for your coffee, but your favorite one has been missing for a few days. You're convinced your partner or roommate has misplaced it, and you start to feel anger rising in your chest. How do you proceed? This is so funny because I have, I'm like a creature of habit. I have my favorite coffee mug that comes mm-hmm. with me. I'm having that like, where's my coffee mug? Um, I would again say first step is to notice what I'm starting to experience, which is anger and TBH. Anger is one of my trigger emotions. Like I get down with lots of other negative emotions. Anger is personally triggering for me. So I would probably have to pay some attention to that and then stop and take a beat. Like I, I, I'm one of a person that likes to physically ground myself. So if I'm like standing at the kitchen sink, I probably would grab onto the kitchen sink and use it as a way to like, okay, I'm going to take a beat. Um, and then actually incorporate. So we have a thing in DBT called think skills, which is where we try to put ourselves into somebody else's perspective. So before I would jump, I would maybe do quick, sort of think skill and go, okay, where could it be? Where could somebody else have put it? Why would they maybe have had it? What's another benign way that this could be happening? Like it could be in the dishwasher. So I would probably do a quick check-in of all the other possible solutions, which would help me problem solve as well as stay in the moment and be thinking of, of a step to take, not so much paying attention to all the feelings that I may be having. So, All right. So um, I would get another mug and I would pour the coffee into my non-favorite mug really, really slowly. Ooh. And I would watch the liquid mm. and, and I, would, I would have like all, all of my thoughts about the other mug, I would envision them sort of just going down into the emptiness, into the abyss, just flowing away from me. <laughs> and then I would take my, my newly poured mug and I would slowly sip the coffee and really think about the flavor and and just ground myself in the fact that the coffee is what is important not <laughs> the vessel uh, in which my it bullshit is meter stored. is like wah, wah. like i want dial a friend jen on the phone is this sound anything like what craig would actually do if you snagged his favorite coffee i'm mug? not a coffee drinker <laughs> are you really not he is not and you just created a coffee mindfulness meditation. You there, totally friend. did. Yeah, it's like <laughs> copyright. Craig Pullman, 2019. All right, I am. Yep, go for it. Award the points. No, well, okay. To the fake. You had no, mindfulness scenario. That was what I was expecting. The non-judgment of not jumping to conclusions, yep. which that's kind of the answer I was looking for. But that was a curveball. That surprised me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go with four thousand for Craig. 3,000 again for fights. Okay. Fair. All right. So we're, Fair. what are we, 5,000 to six? I feel like I want to put a little hash mark by something that's happening here, though, during the quiz that I think would be a good thing for you and I to talk about later. So, What's like, happening? Like, well, like, his approach is very visual. Yes. And my approach mm. is very cognitive. DBT so skills let's put a, wise, like, yes. Craig, put a little, because you're a better yep. rememberer than I am, put a little thing by that that we'll talk right. about later. As a good thing. Like, it's a yes. very good thing. That there are different ways this to This is apply. not a one-size-fits-all yes. activity. I'm going to okay. use that coffee meditation. That's super great, though. Cheers. All right. Yeah. Cheers to your coffee meditation. All right. Last one. So, 
and this is pretty specific to us because we give presentations a lot, but hopefully uh-huh. others can relate. So you're about to give a presentation on your area of expertise to an auditorium full of well-respected colleagues and experts in your field. Beads of sweat are starting to form on the surface of your palm and your heart is pounding in your chest. What mindfulness tricks can you employ to get in the zone for your talk? Well, why don't I go, I'll go first this time? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's ready. So I think you're going to... I think you got a lot loaded up. <laughs> <laughs> You're loaded for bear over there. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna really focus on breathing, um, and I would bring a rhythm to my breathing. And I actually and I would and I'd also I try to get a handle on my temperature mm. and um, and kind of use some biofeedback. And we haven't really mm-hmm. introduced that that term uh-huh. here this episode, but Better be good. really try <laughs> to get. And even like wherever I'm feeling the heat, like in my pits or whatever, mm-hmm. and try to um, visualize maybe some ice cubes there, and just try to get myself calmer, and 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 also maybe think about like um, you know I identify what my what what are really my fears here? Mm-hmm. What's what's really what what are these people really going to be thinking of me? And mm-hmm. and not judge them, mm-hmm. not judge those thoughts. Good. Good job, Craig. Um, it's funny because little note, like I do a fair amount of speaking and presenting and I get crazy nervous before I do it. So this one hits home because it's funny. Is, and I really love to present and talk. And yet I get crazy anxious before I do it. So I a trick that I developed for myself because where it shows up is in my stomach. Like everything goes right to my stomach. So I and, and it's a and it's something that I do with clients. I really pay attention and I, I really focus hard on that feeling in my stomach. And I try to then in, um, sort of go through a step of, of picturing, rounding it up, almost like you would row, uh, roll dough, like how you would roll it into mm-hmm. a ball, um, and then give it like a little personification. And that changes every time. But again, it's really drawing attention to what's going on. So maybe it's a little green monster or maybe it's a little purple monster or whatever it is. And that I I engage that of actively being like, and you're going to go. Like you're going to get out of my body. And I just pay attention to then really what I'm thinking. And I do some self-validation in the moment. Like it's, it makes a ton of sense that I'm nervous. I'm in a room full of a bunch of people. It matters to me that they hear what I have to say. I want them to feel like they're going away with something. So I do a lot of self-validation of the idea that it's okay to be nervous, right? Like it's really okay to be nervous. I'm just noticing it. So a lot of that non-judgmental thinking. And then try to shift to a space of, but I'm super excited to be here. So I switch to gratitude of trying to sort of then switch mindset of getting into a space and naming the reasons why I'm glad. And then usually doing some breathing, like slowing my breathing down as well. And yeah, now may I bring something bring something else up. I'm not trying to improve my answer. Mm-hmm. I, I acknowledge okay. I can only be judged on what I just said. Okay. But another thought as you're talking, mm-hmm. um, sort of being mindful of the the benefits of anxiety. Yes, and I, I talked to a lot of clients about the Yerkes Dotson law, the the curve, so that. You know, it, if you're really low anxiety, that's not going to be very functional. If you're really, really high anxiety, that's not going to be very functional. But if you've got moderate anxiety, that actually can help you perform, especially, you know, athletes. And so if I were to visualize myself, my feelings, and trying to, like, slide down the curve so I get to that so get middle ground. The sweet spot. Is that, yeah. yeah, the sweet spot. Would that be a mindful yeah. That's what we technique? were talking about earlier, right? That, that, that if we go back to primary sort of caveman emotions, the reason that we had anxiety is it's supposed to be motivating. It's supposed to be the thing that we experience that makes us go, oh, this is important. Oh, this is meaningful. I need to do something about this, right? So it's that idea that that anxiety that you're experiencing is good because it means I want to do a good job at whatever it is that I'm doing. So I think that's awesome that you bring that picture of if I don't feel anything, if you and I weren't anxious at all walking into that room, I'd go, oh, that's a problem because either you don't care enough or maybe you've got a problem experiencing emotions. But if it's too high, it's going to get in the way of what you want to do. So Maybe the visualization, even that's a good one that you've given people of like, I want to get to this sweet spot of this arc of like, and I can draw my attention to that. That's right. So, so I really, I would think about a bell curve and right. I put, yeah. I would, you know, I would want my anxiety not to be, you know, too high. I'd want it to slide sort of up and get to the top of the hill where optimal performance can 
We might do, be looking do, do, at some do. bonus points. <laughs> I, look at it. I, I really wasn't trying to game yeah. the system. Yes, he was. So you guys both had some good grounding and some naming your emotion, naming your thoughts. The visual, both of you included visualization. Pretty, pretty even answers. Fights four thousand. Craig two thousand for his original answer. Oh, bonus points five hundred for Yerky Stats. <laughs> I I, th- I felt like this was good. You guys it felt very non-competitive. I, I you guys like fed off each other's like answers. We were, it was this was good. We were mindful. Do you want to let emotion get in the way? Do you want a fun question? A quick one? Or oh, sure. Wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. And then we have to find out who won. Yeah, Brandon. I can see the top of your pretty little head. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what do we okay. got? He's pointing Which, to fights. <laughs> pointing at fights. I think her point total was Split decision to fights. Well played. Just I'm really, for fun. I, I'm really honored to have even gotten in the ring with you. <laughs> Just for fun, this is a fictional scenario. Oh, Lord. You're on the rooftop of a 34-story office building, and the helicopter landing pad is covered in explosives set to detonate in seconds. What do you do? And name that movie. Oh, Die, Die Hard. Hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Air 5. <laughs> but, like, I was already done, because I'm going to be you're like 34. I'm like, D- done. done. I have a crazy fear of heights. My, there's not enough mindfulness in the world. That That's funny. I have a fear of, of being uh, detonated. Like oh. exploded. Like, like literally? Yeah. Like truly? Oh, yeah. I, no. Okay. <laughs> so Gullible's John McClane clearly has in that situation, more, he's more skilled at mindfulness oh, than both of you. Oh, 150%. I, I admit. I just want to point yeah. out in that situation, the heights, the height is the least of your problems. Mm-hmm. But the funny, so this is, a, I think this is like a great little example that you used because to me, like, the height would be my issue. I we did the high ropes course at the Whitewater Center oh, yeah. okay, as like a team yeah. building thing. And here's me like I knew I'm afraid of heights, right? But I'm like, oh, I, this is what I do. Like I, I treat anxiety disorders and I practice mindfulness and it'll be totally fine. I'll get on top of this thing and it'll be great. I had a two hour panic attack. It was the worst experience of my life. There was not a skill on the planet. And I loved that because I I was working my tail off. And it gave me such great connectiveness to my clients of when they come back and they're like, I tried so hard and it just wouldn't work because, I mean, I put every skill out there and I was able to get through it, right? Like I completed the entire thing and I was miserable for it, two hours. It was an empathy booster. It was. That's exactly what it was. But the heights would get, mm-hmm. nope, done. done. I would get on top of that building and, and want to get blown up. Well, Lisa, this was awesome. Thank you Yay. guys for having Thanks me. Thanks a lot. So fights, something has occurred to me during our discussion this uh-huh. episode about mindfulness and its potential connection to the psychological concept of flow, which so, I think about a lot. And so so flow Not is, Brandon's hair. <laughs> and not Look the spin-off flow. of Alice, the sitcom from So, oh, yeah, flow. so F-L-O-W. So yeah. flow um, is this idea of the, the state of mind that you achieve when you're completely immersed in an activity and you lose track of time. That's how immersed you are in it, mm. but you're productive. That's the, so two things, you lose track of time, mm-hmm. but you're also productive. So just if you're just watching a movie, that's not flow. Nope. Even if you're thinking of nothing other than the movie, but if you're, assembling like a Lego set and mm-hmm. you're just you're only thinking right. about that and you and you know two hours goes by and as far as you're concerned it was five minutes that's flow so do you see I mean how how does flow connect with mindfulness is there an overlap connection of any kind well I think that what you gave a great example of is mindfulness except it seems to me that there's a lack of intentionality. Like, right. you know, because what I would, what I was thinking as you were giving that example is, oh man, if two hours goes by, what have you missed? Right. You, your flow is intentional in terms of uh, <clears throat> utility and production. You're actually... You, you're you, getting you're, something done. Right. You're um, like a carpenter or a chef. I get into flow when I'm designing PowerPoints and things, and I'm mm-hmm. writing. Mm-hmm. That That's all flow. Um, but... It's that's the intentionality. You're not really thinking about your mental state. Right, that, that's why the time lose, slips by. 
And I would say you're probably maybe losing some of the emotion that comes behind it. Because I like we we recently last week traveled and my husband calls it work mode when I start to pack. Right. But the problem is, is that he, that also sort of drives him crazy because I'm super productive and I am totally in it and I'm in my head and I'm I'm very intentional and I'm going from thing to thing and it's all very organized. But I may miss that like one of my kids has just smacked another one of my kids and they're like fighting with each other because I'm in work mode. So I think the difference between being um, what I would maybe say is over focused. So like zoned in in a way that then means I'm zoning everything else out is that missing of being present and aware of my surroundings, what's coming in, what my reaction or response is, and then how do I, how do I give back to that? Right. So I think there's a difference between being, what's the word I'm looking for? We talk about it sometimes with individuals that get super hyper-focused. That was, or Yes. Yeah, or freight train brain. Yeah, it's, oh, I knew there was a freight. Like, and that's that's not necessarily positive, because what it means is is that you maybe have been able to block everything out, but you're not really paying attention to the world around you and mm-hmm. and how you maybe are emotionally responding or what's happening in your body. Because do you ever get stressed when you're making a, like a PowerPoint? Like, do you ever get like a heightened sense of stress of oh, I've got to get this in there? And I, th- like, does that ever come in? Um, only if. There's a problem that I'm struggling to solve. Okay. So if I can't get an effect to work the way I'm visualizing, in that situation, you know, it's it's connecting, it's using the skills that I have and the technology to create what I have in my mind. Like I have it, I have it visualized. I know what I want it to look like, but I, if I'm not making that connection, and that doesn't happen very often. But when it does, that snaps me out of flow and I get frustrated. Usually I'm just I'm doing my thing and it's just like playing the piano. You know, it's just sort of just happens. So what would happen though if I came into your office and was like, hey Craig, and just sort of came in, like we, you know, we have a very open door policy around here, right? Which right. means that we which is in, is meant to encourage people to pop into each other's office and say, hey, and see what's going on. So if you were in your flow and I interrupted you, would that right. be a mindful response? Like right. You know, so I mean, I think there's the difference, right? Mm-hmm. So when I'm sort of thinking, and I know, I don't, I guess, because I come back to mindfulness because it's, it's something either I'm doing with my clients very in the moment or when I'm practicing it myself is usually when I'm in relationship with another person, is that I'm constantly aware of what's coming in, mm-hmm. what's happening in my body, mind, body, spirit, and then what's coming back out. So if I were to like pop into your office while you're in the flow, right? I, I, I would, it would, I would disengage. But would you be annoyed? Would you be frustrated? Would you be like, ugh, as you? I might be inter- a little bit. Yeah. See, and that's yeah. that's not a criticism because if I if, when I'm in work mode, when I am packing our car or I'm packing suitcases, and my husband's like, "Hello," I'm like, "Dude, I'm working. Mm-hmm. I got you know." So it's about the result. It's product, not process. Yeah. Right. And I feel like mindfulness is process mm-hmm. in hopes of a good product. So let, let's talk clinical applications of mindfulness okay. practice. So a word that we've used several times so far is anxiety. So mm-hmm. obviously your clients who have anxiety are going to benefit from mindfulness. What are some other clinical issues, diagnoses, what have you, that, that you've used mindfulness with and for, with good benefit? I would say there really isn't one that it's not good for. Okay, so take I, mean, us, I would take us through I would some. I would put that out there. But you know, anger, right? Because mm-hmm. what you think about going back to that um, that we talked about before of thoughts drive feelings, feelings drive behavior. I was looking for something to draw on because it's like the visual. But you know, if if you could say, um, so I'm drawing my little thing here because I can't handle not having the visual, but. Is, is so thoughts create feelings, feelings create behavior. Mindfulness is this break, right? So if you think of one okay. plus two equals three, it's like drawing a hash mark over that equal sign, okay? okay? So when we think about, though, that feelings, every feeling has what we call an action urge. It's right. the thing that that feeling makes us want to do. So now put any sort of emotion in that feeling. So anger, action urge for anger is to what? Attack. Right, lash out. Right, like lash out. Okay, fear makes me want to run away. 
Love makes me want to connect. Now, interestingly, love and anger are the two emotions that we can experience that can actually get us into a lot of trouble. Now, so, me, me, okay, so my anxiety before what I was talking about of heights, it may keep me from doing a high ropes course. It may keep me from taking my kid on a Ferris wheel. Okay, that's that's sad, but that's not going to get me into trouble. That's not going to seriously damage relationships. But love, I can love the wrong thing. I can want to connect with a person that is dangerous for me, that's unhealthy for me, right? So it's that space of being able to say, I'm experiencing this emotion and I've got to stop and think. I've got to stop and check in and notice and observe before I act. Because this emotion is going to make me want to attack or it's going to make me want to run away or it's going to make me want to connect or it's going to make me want to yell or holler or scream or fill in the blank, self-harm, drink, take drugs, right? Because there's an urge for that emotion. And if I don't have the ability to notice it, observe, and take a beat, I may then engage in a behavior to try to get it out. Because we see these emotions, if we can't think of them non-judgmentally, if we put that judgment on it, we immediately go, I've got to do something with this emotion. How about mindfulness with couples and families? So this is then, can I, so you asked me where I use it. Parenting is a huge place and space where mindfulness, in my opinion, is paramount, which is why I'm saying, to, you know, to, to moms and dads, like, great time to do a mindfulness exercise is before the kids come through the door. Whether you're going through car line, whether you're going to the bus stop, whether they're going to be walking through your front door, do a mindfulness activity, right? Um, if you know you're about to have an intense conversation with your partner, like there is something that's come up and you are going to have this conversation and your priority is to maintain the relationship. This relationship matters to me. I want to do this well. And I want there to be productivity, right? Because I can holler and scream at anybody and and feel like I'm getting my point across, but I guarantee you nothing good's going to come out of that conversation because you're only going to be paying attention to my tone of voice or the fact that I'm yelling at you. But if I want to get a message across, I take a beat. I think about my thoughts. I pay attention to how I'm feeling and I'm going, right now I'm really angry. Okay, well, that makes me want to lash out. It's probably not going to get me any place. How do I not get to a place but where I'm not – it's not that I'm not angry anymore, but I'm just noticing and I'm observing and I'm paying attention. It looks a lot like more I go thoughts and then I go feelings and then I come back to thoughts and then I examine my feelings and then I come back to thoughts and then I engage. To me, that's what mindfulness looks like. And so whether I'm doing it with myself – I'm engaging in with my partner. I'm as a parent with family. I mean, I teach this to my kids. There's a great book called Sitting Still Like a Frog. That's a book that introduces mindfulness for kids. There's a great mm -hmm. app called Stop, Breathe, and Think that I use with all of my clients. And they have Stop, Breathe, and Think for adolescents, Stop, Breathe, and Think for adults, Stop, Breathe, and Think for kids. So, I mean, there's you can teach this to all ages. ADHD. Oh, huge, huge. I mean, I'm yeah. sure because you, you do a lot of work in that area that that's a huge skill because especially if there's that impulsivity, you know, yeah. this is a great way to try to say – because what you're doing, again, and this is how I explain it to kids. Like all kids are like, I'm lifting weights. I'm getting buff. I'm lifting weights for this part of my brain. One of my sons has ADHD. And he has an academic coach that he had at one this, this past year. And part of what he coached him, it wasn't just remediation of skills and, and whatnot, an organization, it was mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I actually used the mm -hmm. term mindfulness mm -hmm. with a 12-year-old. Yeah. Oh, 100%. How, used... how, how young do you think you could – well, you probably wouldn't use the word mindfulness – with a real little kid. Well, in like, our, how, what's in the our youngest? house, we do. Do you really? Oh, oh well, yeah. Of course. That's I mean, part I, and parcel. Well, and and – we call okay, so we call it in our household, and I had drawn this earlier. We call it wise mind. So here's I'm trying to not cover my face, but I'm going to cover my face for a second. There's a little Venn diagram that I drew. So hopefully everybody knows what a Venn diagram is, right? Two circles that show Overlap. up, and there's like a middle weird shaped thing in the middle. But it's states of mind. So it's emotional mind, rational mind, and wise mind. So feelings brain is emotional mind rational mind is my thinking, my logic. Okay. So emotional mind is all emotions. Rational mind, no emotions. This is all logic, all reason, all facts. But in the middle is wise mind. And wisdom is different than intelligence, right? So we have base IQ, smarts, and then we have wisdom, 
which is the combination of what I think, my logic, my facts, and how I feel. And and a lot of times people think like, oh, I've got to make this decision, you know, with my head and not my heart. It's not wise because feelings communicate things to us and for us, right? So if my if I'm having a feeling, I need to pay attention because my brain's telling me something. So what we use in our house is wise mind. Like, I need you to get into wise mind. Like, I need you to get to that space, right? And so we do a wise mind activity. So the big time that I do it with my kids, my oldest is anxious. And, and he's how old? He just turned nine. And so he can get very anxious and he's had some tough things happen to him at a pretty young age. And so he's actually developed a couple of times now like an actual anxiety attack. And so he, we, I use, I mean, we use the word mindfulness. We do grounding exercises. We do breathing exercises. For my little one, who's about to be five, I started with her at bedtime and we just do wise mind at bedtime. We do, she calls it breathing. Can, mommy, can we do breathing? She asked for it. Oh, yeah. Especially if she gets scared, like afraid of the dark, because one of the things we say in our household is what is true in the light is true in the dark. So that idea of like, okay, I get to this space, that's wisdom. So I remember how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. So what's true in the light is true in the dark. So I pay attention. So we use those activities. So you can really use it at any age, any age for anything. I mean, I've end of life. Work is a huge space where mindfulness is used a lot about the idea of honing pain or fear. So to, you know, long-winded answer to your first question, I don't think there is a clinical area or circumstance or relationship where mindfulness shouldn't, and I, I hate to use that word because it rings of judgment, but where it shouldn't try to be a part of what's it going on. certainly has potential yeah. in all those areas. Mm-hmm. All right, you're, you ready? You're, gonna, you're gonna take me through a, an exercise now, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, not that I think you're an adolescent, but this is one of the ones that I love to do with Baby. my adolescents. So I have given Craig two of those little mini like Hershey's, shout out to Hershey's, although I'm a Mars person, uh, chocolate bars. So Craig, remember that the point of this exercise is to notice and observe. So the first thing that I want you to do is I'm going to ask you to unwrap that little candy bar. No. Okay. Am, am I putting these on yet? What am I doing with it? No. Okay. You're going to tell me when to put these on? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So I'll, let me just follow. I'll, I'm going to now follow instructions. Why do you got to be, be a problem child? What am I doing Are you now? getting anxious? So I'm going to walk you through the whole thing so you have the sense. First time I want you to put that in your mouth, and I just want you to chew it up. Chew it up super fast. But I want you to notice. Wait, would you slow down? <laughs> You're gonna give me all the directions. Listen, no, but no, listen is... to the instructions real quick. I want you to notice as you're chewing on this what's happening in your body, what's happening in your brain. So, what's your brain telling you and talking to you, and what's happening in your body and your feelings as you eat that chocolate bar? Okay, so now you can put your little headphones on. So he can't hear when I'm talking about him. So interestingly, he just closed his eyes, which says to me he's trying to concentrate really hard on what's happening, which is good. But sometimes we're not all afforded the luxury of being able to close our eyes. So do not automatically assume that mindfulness always has to be eyes closed, centered kind of behavior. His skin tone is actually changing a little bit, which is interesting. Okay, take them off. Take your headphones off. Okay, what'd you notice? I noticed that it wasn't so much that the candy bar disintegrated when I chewed it. It, it, it kind of burst. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like there was this explosion that went to different corners of my mouth. And, and Did then... Did you just say there was an explosion in your mouth? Yes. <sighs> oh, so many jokes. Okay, yeah. this um, second time... Oh, did, oh, sorry, keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then... Um, and then I, I really was trying to like grab all those little pieces of chocolate and bring them back to my tongue so I could taste them. I didn't want to waste anything. Okay, what were some of your thoughts? Do you have any? Were you thinking anything as you're chewing that down? No, <laughs> I really was thinking about the chocolate. Okay, this second time I want you to put the little chocolate bar in your mouth, but this time you are not allowed to chew it. 
You okay. just have to leave it in your mouth and allow it to melt. You can sort of suck on it. But I really want you to, again, pay attention now. Thoughts, body sensation, feelings, and if there's a difference between the two for you. Okay. Headphones are going on. Headphones are going on. And the chocolate bar is going down. So again, for those of you who can't see, he immediately closed his eyes, which was interesting. When I do this with adolescents in particular, a lot of times they will end up getting very frustrated because if it's something that they like, like most times students like chocolate and in our offices we have these like candy drawers so they're full of all different types of candy. Most of the times people just want to eat it. They just want to put it in their mouth. So they get super frustrated with having to just sit there. But it's something that I want them to pay attention to because it's okay to get annoyed or frustrated. It's okay to want to do something different than what we've been given a direction to or what maybe is the right thing or good for us in that moment. But we need to notice that I'm annoyed or frustrated, and then what do I want to do with that emotion? Do I want to just go ahead and act and, and chew up the chocolate in spite of the direction, or am I going to try to power through? What are the skills that I put in place instead of? It takes longer. Um, sometimes students begin to get impatient because it's taking a lot longer, and they think it's weird because we're just sitting in silence sucking on a piece of chocolate. So there's a lot of different emotions that can potentially come up and then some really judgmental thoughts about what's happening. And so it's that shift between instant gratification, most times people like to just come in and like chew it up, versus delayed gratification, versus having to wait, versus having to use patience or restraint, and how that just feels differently in our bodies. But again, not bad. We don't need to judge those as being negative. Headphones off, brother. What'd you notice? That was really annoying. Yay! That was so funny. That was one of the things that I was talking about. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you noticed. Here's the interesting thing. Okay, a little backstory about my family. Okay. The, my 12-year-old son, Gabe, who has ADHD, he and I <clears throat> are the slow eaters. Oh, he's he, When we go out for ice cream, he and I will lick the cones to the bottom. The other three, including my wife, they chew their ice cream and gulp it down, and they're done in a fraction of the time. So when I when I eat these chocolates and I eat them, I eat it like the way the second way. I put it the, and I do not chew it, but then I go into flow, and I don't think about it. I just have the flavor. But now since I had to be yes. really focused on it. And thinking about it, it sucked. This is so great. So this is such a great thing. So now you get what I'm talking about, about the difference between flow and mindfulness. Because mindfulness is I am present and I notice. And what's funny is what did you want to do with that annoyance? I wanted to chew down and I wanted to get it over with. So how did you go, though? Because a lot of times, so then annoyance, irritability, the action urge would then be to do something with that, to chew up the chocolate or to get right. away from the person or to stop doing the homework that's frustrating us. How did you, what thoughtfulness did you have to bring to I keep going? Even though this is annoying to me, I stick with it. Well, I was really determined. I was not going to mm -hmm. give in. I was gonna. I was gonna see this through. It was kind of like being on the treadmill. I'm not gonna slow down until I hit five miles or seven miles or whatever. Did you validate for yourself that it was okay to be annoyed? Did you stay in a non-judgmental space? Um. Well. Like, did you start to judge me or judge the exercise? No. 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 I judge you for other reasons. Oh, well, yeah, um, true. <laughs> I. But I did make the connection during the exercise to how I that I, I noticed that this is how I normally eat the chocolate. But it doesn't annoy me like it does now. And I was thinking about eating the chocolate while I'm working and I'm, when I'm in flow. And that, so I, I was thinking about the difference, how it, mm -hmm. in, in, in this other situation, it's not nearly as annoying. And I would probably say, so you're telling me you do it while you're working. Because I would say a lot of times people then get mindless. So eating is actually a really great time to be mindful. Mm -hmm. Right. I pay attention I to what I'm eating. How is my body responding? You know, we talk about intentional eating. So I stop when I'm full. I keep going when I'm hungry, you know, and and I would think it'd be really great for disordered eating. It, I was about to say it's a huge piece for disordered eating because a lot of times individuals mm -hmm. that have struggled in that area, they they stop listening to their body. And so that whole concept of 
eating when I'm hungry, stopping when I'm full, they, they lose that. The sensation goes away. And so coming back to the idea of really paying attention and without judgment. And how about backing up from there? How about food preparation? Did we mention that earlier? As, a, as mindful? Well, as I think we, we listed a bunch of other activities that mm-hmm. could be mindful. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, we did say cooking. But mm-hmm. I would imagine, you know, preparing the salad and really getting into what you're seeing and the sensations and even the sounds. Which comes back to you are obviously a visual person. So if you were my client, I would recognize that you're a highly visual person, right? And so guided imagery would probably be great mindfulness for you, tactile, so doing things involving your senses. So in DBT, we have a thing called self-soothe with six senses. Yes, not the like, I see dead people, six senses, but we include yeah. movement as a sixth sense. So that would probably be great for you. I'm a much more cognitive slash visual person. So I really like to get into the idea of thoughts and making connections between thinking. And so, you know, for me, walking through those steps, I had a... um just yesterday, I had a client in my office who we – she was beginning to get very, very anxious in my office. And so I was trying to draw her to what she was experiencing in her body, right? So we were going to do mindfulness in the moment. We were going to stop what we were doing because she's been struggling with this idea. So I was like, okay, let's stop. Well, she couldn't get there. She couldn't pay attention to what was happening in her body because her thoughts were racing, So it was like, okay, we need to take this to a next level. And so we actually busted out an app that gave us an organized, um, the Stop, Breathe, and Think app that I love so much allows you to do like a real-time input of body sensations and thoughts and emotions. And then it like spits out an exercise. And so then we got up out of my office and we went out and we have a lake right outside our office and we walked around the lake. We did a mindful walk. So one of the things that we processed was, okay, so the visualization wasn't working for her. Those thoughts were racing too much, right? She needed to do something that was cognitive in relationship to also getting herself moving. So we got up and then it was, you know, I paid attention to the sounds that I'm hearing. So what am I hearing? What am I seeing? What am I feeling? But then when we got back in, one of the things that we had to process was she's not always going to have the ability to get up. And, and leave. Like, so she's at school. She's not going to be able to just get up and walk out of the classroom. So my, but it really helped. She acknowledged that that really helped her hone in her thoughts, get them sort of filed back and more organized. But then, okay, so how do I practice this more so that when I'm in a place and space like school and I can't just get up, I can still engage this part of my brain in some kind of way. The, the frontal lobe right behind the, mm-hmm. the forehead. Yep. So... You know, I, I think it'd be really good to kind of bring this in for landing by reminding folks the, the that working definition that you gave up front. Mm-hmm. I think it's so good because, you know, there there, there, there are a lot of things that, that are kind of floating around out there in our culture, yoga and meditation and, and flow, but it's not necessarily mindful. Mm-mm. So, yeah, yeah, take us back to what that working definition. So I pay attention on purpose. So it's intentional. It's not just I stick the piece of candy in my mouth and then my mind goes away. So I pay attention on purpose to how I'm thinking and how I'm feeling without judgment. The feelings aren't bad. They're not wrong. So I can then choose how I want to react and respond. Latanya used the mindfulness practice of leaves on a stream and noticing the thoughts propelling her anxiety, that she's not an eloquent speaker that she'll never come up with interesting conversation topics, that she'll disappoint others by not engaging with them. She visualized these thoughts as leaves and let them float by in her mind. She identified her fears in specific ways. Fears of judgment, embarrassment about being uncertain, sadness about feeling isolated. Part of her preparation for the family reunion was practicing, such as with basketball teammates. She practiced mindful listening, paying close attention not just to others' words, but also their nonverbal cues. She she practiced mindful awareness of surroundings and activities, noticing sounds, colors, food, and nature. She observed her breath without any expectation of changing it. She brought awareness to physical sensations, including relaxed areas, as opposed to just focusing on tension. This practice boosted her confidence enough to decide to attend the reunion. 
During the drive there, she observed her anxiety and associated fear-based thoughts. But she was also mindful of her breathing as she watched trees pass by. She noticed her anxiety ebb, and she kept the mindfulness going throughout the event, which turned out to be a very gratifying experience. Brandon Gage is our producer, Sean Beck is our sound engineer, theme music composer, and video editor. Executive producers are Dave Verhagen and Frank Gaskell. Contributors to this episode were Elise Howell and Mike Harris. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, psychbytes.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbytes. You can also reach us via email, podcast at psychbytes.com. Please send us questions, thoughts, and suggestions for future show topics. We are available just about anywhere you find your podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Please spread the word and subscribe. Your positive ratings and reviews really help us build our audience. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Bites Podcast. Podcast.